Now let's move on to the next one. It says, suppose that a 5% increase in the price of chicken sandwiches results in the following changes at a local Wendy's. Burger sales increase by 3%, drink sales drop by 3%, and chicken sandwich sales fall by 7.5%. Compute the relevant price and cross-price elasticity of demand. Well, for each of these, we need to determine which elasticity of demand is appropriate. We know there's a 5% increase in the price of chicken sandwiches. If burger sales increase by 3%, then we're comparing how the price of chicken sandwiches, one good, affect the sales of another good. So this would be a cross-price coefficient. For that, we know it's elasticity, subscript xy, to represent the cross price of the two goods. And that's going to be, in our numerator, the percentage change, delta, in the quantity of, in this case, it's going to be burger sales, so I'll put burgers here, divided by the percentage change in the price of chicken sandwiches. Now, we don't need to use the midpoint method here because we already have our percentages. It says that chicken sandwiches increase by 5%, so we can put 0 0.05 in our denominator. And it says that our burger sales increase by 3%, so we can put 0 0.03 in our numerator. Well, 3% over 5% is going to equal 0.6. What information can we glean from this? Well, first, we know that we have a absolute value of less than 1, meaning this is an inelastic response. Makes sense, because even though chicken sandwiches increased by 5%, it only affected burger sales by 3%. So we have an unresponsive cross-price elasticity. We can also identify that because the signage of this is positive, burgers and chicken sandwiches are substitutes. Let's now do the same thing, but for drink sales. Same formula, but we're going to have in the denominator, I'm sorry, in the numerator, the percentage change in the quantity of drinks and how those respond to a change in the price of chicken sandwiches. Plug in our numbers. We know the price went up by 5%, so that's the same. But when it comes to drinks, drink sales dropped. So we have a negative 0 0.03 here, which gives us a coefficient of negative 0.6. Again, what can we glean? We know this is an inelastic response. Even though the price of chicken sandwiches went up by 5%, drink sales only dropped by 3%, unresponsive. We also know because the cross-price elasticity coefficient is negative, that drinks and chicken sandwiches are complements. For the next one, we're looking at how the price of chicken sandwiches and chicken sandwich sales change. This is not cross price. This is the price elasticity of demand. Elasticity of demand. And you can see the percentage change in the quantity uh, demanded of chicken sandwiches divided by the percentage change in the price of chicken sandwiches. The price, again, went up by 5%. And chicken sandwich sales fell by 7.5%, so negative 0.075. If you do this, you're going to get a negative value, and it's going to be 1.5. What does this tell us? Well, the negative is redundant. Price elasticity of demand always moves inversely. If we take the absolute value of this, we're going to get a value greater than 1, meaning this is an elastic product, which makes sense. Price goes up by 5%, but people buy 7.5% less. That is a very responsive consumer. This information is important, particularly for businesses, because they're not just interested in how a change in the price of one product, like chicken sandwiches, is going to affect their chicken sandwich sales. 
They're also interested in how that increase in the price of chicken sandwiches will affect drink sales and burger sales so they can make the best pricing decisions across all their products. The next one says basic commodities like wheat are known to have low income elasticity, such as 0.9. Over time, consumers' incomes tend to rise. Is wheat a normal or inferior good? To determine whether something is normal or inferior, we would use the income elasticity and look at the signage. Because the signage here is positive, 0.9, we know that wheat is a normal good. Another way of putting it is, as income goes up, people buy more wheat. As income rises, what will happen to the demand for wheat and the quantity of wheat purchased? Well, we know it's positive, it's a normal good, so as income goes up, people will demand more wheat. We can even quantify this. The elasticity coefficient tells us how a 1% change in income will affect the demand for wheat. So for every 1% increase in income, we would expect the demand for wheat to go up by 0.9%. Extrapolate. For every 10% increase in uh, income, we would expect the demand for wheat to go up by 9%, so on and so forth. What will happen to the proportion of their incomes that consumers spend on wheat? Well, you'll notice that because wheat is a uh, inelastic, income inelastic good here, income will increase at a faster rate than the demand for wheat will. We just said that if income goes up by 10%, the demand for wheat is only going to go up by 0.9% or 9%. And that means that the proportion of their income that they spend on wheat will decrease over time. Let me give you another way of thinking about this. Let's say you have an income equal to $1,000 a month. And let's say you're spending on wheat is equal to $100 per month. Well, that is a 10% budget for wheat. So we added a zero there, so put 100. But let's say your income goes up, and it goes up by 10%. It goes to $1,100 a month. What's going to happen to your wheat? Well, you were spending 100 on wheat. That's going to go up by 9%. So 109. Well, if you do the math, if you take 109 divided by 1100, you get 0.099 or 9.9%. Notice something. Your income increased by 10%, but your wheat consumption went up by 9%. Therefore, the proportion of your budget spent on wheat went from a 10% portion to a 9.9% .9 portion. This is the reality of income inelastic goods. As your income goes up, those goods are going to make up a smaller and smaller proportion of your budget. Food is very income inelastic because as our income goes up, we do buy more food, but not in proportion to our income. So over time, if you go from making 50,000 to 500,000 to 5 million a year, you're going to find that food consumption is going to become a smaller and smaller proportion of your budget. For contrast, let's imagine that it's not a income elasticity coefficient of 0.9. Let's imagine that it's unit elastic. It's one. We can do this same exercise starting with 1,000 as our income and 100 spending on wheat gives us a allocation of 10% of our income on wheat. Let's imagine now that income increases by 10%. Well, we still go to 1100, but check this out. Because the coefficient would be one, our wheat consumption would go from 100 to 110, which would make up a 10% proportion. So when you're dealing with an income elasticity that is unit elastic, as our income grows, our, the proportion of that good that we spend on um, wheat will stay the same. 
And then you can do the same exercise for uh, an income elastic good, where you would have a coefficient greater than one. In that case, if your income goes up, you're going to find your spending on that particular product increase more rapidly and become a larger proportion of your budget.